Hi everyone, welcome back to another meditation. My name is Sage and I work for the Oregon City Public Library. Today I want to talk about kind of a heavy topic and that is the idea of ego death. And you might hear that and be immediately turned off and that's okay. It's much more intense than it seems much more intense than what it really is, and a lot of that is about the language that's used to describe this concept. Um, so first I want to talk about ego in general, and then I want to talk about death in general, and then bring it together for this idea of ego death or dissolving our ego temporarily in order to be able to address and observe our own biases. And that's really the point of ego death, is to be able to see how your biases are controlling the information that you take in and that you process and, that, and how you perceive the world. So in a time when there might be a lot of issues arising around you that you don't feel necessarily apply directly to you, this allows us to work through our own biases that reflect our own ego, right? Because that's really where our biases come from. And be able to distinguish why am I observing this this way, or why am I perceiving the world this way, and what is truth when it comes to being connected with the world, being connected with nature, being connected to others that might not resemble us or that we might not know directly. So this, <laughs> it's a lot to take in. It's a lot, honestly, a lot more than I can explain in 10 minutes or so. I apologize, Callie, my dog over there is eating some sticks, but um, yeah, so let's get into it. So first, let's talk about the concept of ego, and there are a lot of definitions, but for this um, specific topic, I want to talk about kind of like the three facets of ego, uh, one of them being our self-image, how we perceive ourselves based on really how others have perceived us. Hey, Callie. She doesn't care. Um, the next is our self-identity. So really how, not just how we see ourselves, but how we feel ourselves, how we feel our identity from within. And this might relate to different categories that we put ourselves in. For example, um, maybe a religious belief or a political belief, um, and we really put ourselves into that one specific category, and then that filters the information that we choose to receive and choose to identify with. Uh, and then we have um, self-esteem. So this is really a driving force in, you know, like working hard as an employee to get promotions or working hard in school or um, the stories that we tell ourselves about our confidence or our ability, um, the stories that society tells us about our confidence and our abilities. And so all of these things work hand in hand to create this ego, which is really just kind of a filtration system of how we process the information around us. So. This can be really helpful. This can obviously drive us to, uh, you know, keep a clean house and work hard at work or school. Um, but it can also uh, go too far pretty easily, and it often does. And that can be in a more connected way, having a lot of biases, or it can be even more personal, having a lot of self-doubt, a lot of negative thinking, mm, symptoms of anxiety and depression that might be directly linked to how we are perceiving the world and ourselves through our ego. So then we have the concept of death. And anytime we hear this, at least in 
the United States, in a lot of Western societies, we get really scared because it has been perceived as a very scary thing, an unknown thing, the ending of everything. And we get really sad when people we love die. We get really scared of the idea of dying. And that also drives a lot of what we do and the decisions that we make and the risks that we take is based on the potential of death. And it's, uh, you know, just really perceived as a very scary, lonely, individualistic experience. And when we can move away from that idea and start to look at death as um, an ending, yes, maybe, but also a continuation of consciousness, of, but also um, kind of the fact that life continues even though one body may die, uh, then we can start to, you know, move on toward honoring our ancestors, honoring the people who have died, and not think, oh, that's such a sad thing, which in a lot of cases it is, especially if it's premature death, right? But we can start to think of it as more of the natural cycle of life and death, because they are both just as important. So a lot of our resistance to ego death comes from our fear of death <laughs> and our overruling power of our ego. So those two things together is really intense and really scary and I definitely understand. And because of that we have a lot of resistance. So anytime our opinions are challenged, we have a defense mechanism, right? That is the ego really trying to make sense and um, validate our own experience opposed to the challenging opinion. Um, we also see just such a fear in change in general and knowing that you have to often go through a lot of pain and discomfort to experience change. So we find ourselves maybe living more complacently, maybe um, living with our own comfort in what feels comfortable um, and actively going out and seeking a change in the way we perceive the world is extremely scary because there is no known components, right? So that's, to sum it up in eight minutes, that's ego death. And we can practice this in meditation through the act of observance. We talked a little bit about that in the last video I posted. Um, in the act of observance in order to feel more connected and more present. Um, and really that's what it is. It's moving away from seeing the world, even in moments where you're like, okay, I'm being present now, I'm perceiving the world, I'm in the moment, but you're still conceptualizing things with your own bias. So for example, I might say to myself, I am in this present moment, and then I think, wow, I'm really good at meditation, <laughs> or I look around and I see trees and I think about a moment in my life where I fell from a tree and then I have like, you know, a, just the triggering of different memories and different experiences, different things I've been told and it's really easy to just go down um, the path of conceptualizing our own experiences and this is kind of that idea of like crystal thought forms versus um, like liquid thought forms but that's for another video. <laughs> uh, so we this idea is also known in a lot of different cultures and beliefs and spiritual practices as the idea of enlightenment so when i say we're going to practice ego death we're not going to fully achieve ego death especially in five more minutes but we can start to think about it we can start to have it in the back of our minds and potentially in the future we can work 
actively toward letting go and being moving fluidly with the world without a sense of identity and bias at least temporarily so that's the other part of that is that identity is really important especially in our society that requires identity that requires some kind of motivation to and and work ethic and drive to be a better employee or to get a job or to do things that we need to function in the way that the society is set up and so the idea isn't to completely get rid of the ego altogether the idea is to learn how to temporarily lift those biases created by the ego to observe the world more objectively. So let's just take the next four minutes or so to practice this. So get comfy, close your eyes. Take a breath. Listen to the sounds around you. Smell the smells. Feel the textures of your clothing and your hands. Turn on the senses. Notice when your mind drifts, where it goes. Notice what thoughts enter your mind. If those thoughts are ideas or reflections of identity, of self-esteem, of your image, just notice, if you're thinking, well, if someone walked in right now, They'd think I look so silly, or, wow, meditation is really hard. <laughs> Let those thoughts go. Those are the ego. Return to the senses. What do you feel? You can open your eyes if you'd like. What do you see? Again, instead of looking in front of you and saying, I see a leaf or a TV or a couch or a window, instead of putting those words to what you see, break it down into simpler terms. I see the color green. I see a soft texture. I hear crackling. I smell food <laughs> or grass. When the mind wanders, observe where it goes. 
notice what comes in. Are you feeling that control of the ego, that compulsion of the ego? Or can you step around it and open your mind to something new? Feel your body. It's inherent existence here right now. Bring your awareness into the body. Take a breath. Let it go. Look around you, this room, this space, this world that you are connected to just by living in it. Look around you and this time don't even think about what you see. Just allow your eyes to move without identifying what it is you think you know. Let the world breathe with you. Let the world speak to you. And in some ways, as if you're a newborn baby with no developed bias yet, consider the world with these open eyes, with this desire to explore and learn and take in everything. And even though that part of our brain is likely fully developed, if you're 25, I think, <laughs> um, or older, we can still practice. And that's kind of what it becomes as we get older, is a practice to not fall into thinking one specific way or putting ourselves into boxes which is especially hard in a society that loves to categorize and put people into boxes. <sighs> well, thank you all so much for joining me today. I uh, hope to continue this conversation and this idea of ego death, possibly in the next meditation. And I hope that you all just start to kind of have this thought in the back of your mind if you'd like a journaling idea, um, you can even sit down and just write down everything that comes into your mind that is an implicit bias, that is uh, a form of the ego through identity, self-esteem, any of those that we talked about. And that's all I have for now. I hope you'll have a really great day.